Um, well, so welcome everyone. Um, it's wonderful to see you here at NYU Grossman School of Medicine, and, and, and I thank you for coming to our I2I I workshop. Uh, my, my task, as you've heard, is to tell you how we settled on the themes for this workshop. And uh, uh, as, you, as you heard, I've actually been doing some thinking, uh, sort of book length thinking about uh, the history and future of imaging. Uh, so here goes. <clears throat> so our center is interested in developing new technologies um, that can advance both basic discovery and clinical practice. And so we chose to title our workshop from innovation to implementation in imaging, which is eye to eye for short. Um, now, of course, we liked the, the sound of being eye to eye together. Uh, plus also, as you may already have ascertained, we like putting numbers in the middle of our acronym. So there you have it. Um, we've had a number of these workshops before, but we decided for this one that we wanted to step back a little bit and ask a kind of fundamental question. What, what is imaging? And so take a moment, if you would, to think about what imaging means to you. I have a few thoughts for you. We could think about essentially the output of our imaging processes, the generation of visual representations of spatially organized information, right? Those are, that's one working definition for images. Or we can think about the process, the, the use, say, of interactions of various probes with objects in the world, to yield information about the structure of those objects. But I put it to you that at root, imaging is seeing. We are, with all of the varied techniques we've developed, in some ways emulating or augmenting our natural vision. And for that matter, natural vision, seeing, is imaging. It is the interaction of light with objects in the world to create spatial maps of those objects. And as you already heard, our mission in care is bringing people together to create new ways of seeing. So that's our ultimate goal in this workshop. So in order then to explore what's new and what's next in imaging, which I think you're all here to do, I would argue that first we have to look back um, at how all of these remarkable imaging technologies we have first developed. We need to look up a little bit from our disciplinary focus, our, our specialty areas and look for productive connections. We need to look inward to explore the function and dysfunction of our own natural visual systems. Um, and only then, I think, can we really look forward at what imaging has in store. So for that purpose, let me start a little bit farther back than one might normally um, in, in, and, and talk about the deep history of imaging. The first imaging devices, of course, were not ones that we developed. Nature did that for us. So in the early oceans, there was a pretty significant competitive advantage to being able to tell here from there and that led to a kind of an arms race to develop things like these, the uh, pretty advanced trilobite compound I, um, around 500 million BC or so. And from there, it was really just an evolutionary hop, skip, and a jump to our human camera eyes. And our eyes aren't even anywhere near the pinnacle of acuity or really any other measure of function in nature. There are all kinds of animal eyes um, that have remarkable features, many of which have been emulated by uh, artificial imaging. And speaking of that, after we had eyes and brains of our own, it took us a while and a lot of iteration to emulate nature and improve upon it. And I would argue that the first big step was when we learned a simple thing, how to bend light with lenses, as our eyes were doing, but we didn't know that then. Basically, bending light gave us the gift of magnification in the form of telescopes, for example. And this, in turn, gave us access, new access to the cosmos. Now, of course, the very same principles were applied at essentially the same time to create microscopes, which gave us access now to the microcosmos, the world of the very small. And these developments, of course, gave us our first imaging tubes. We're all familiar in this audience with big imaging tubes. Now, I would argue that um, that helped us to see sort of outer space and to some extent inner space, but in order to really look inward, we needed to penetrate the surface of things. And that took another discovery, the discovery in this case of X-rays, something that could pass through objects and be partially attenuated along the way, which gave us the shadow pictures we're now familiar with. And of course, really what was going on is these X-rays as they were passing were kind of summing up all the different 
cross sections of object density along the way, smushing them together into these very useful shadow pictures, which then generated the field of Rankinology, named after the guy who discovered x-rays, now we call it radiology. Well, the next major development, I would argue, was to figure out how to sort out all of those individual slices buried in the sums that we had. And of course, the trick to that was to take multiple different projections from different angles or in other different ways and sort out through mathematics what was inside. And this was, of course, the magic of tomography, which came around um, in this remarkable decade of the 70s. And it also gave us our other more familiar now big imaging tubes. All right. Well, since then, as the 20th century wore on and turned into the 21st, we imagers figured out how to pack all kinds of interesting complementary information into our voxels. We essentially learned how to see the same thing in many complementary ways. And so I'm showing you here juxtaposed uh, and images of the Crab Nebula um, from different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum with different types of telescopes juxtaposed to different images with different contrast in an MRI of the very same subject. And so we have this remarkable diversity of information content now. Well, in order to do that, in order to create these remarkable images, we needed to develop progressively more advanced technology. And when it comes to something like astronomy, basically it became clear that bigger is better. And this is for reasons of resolution and signal to noise ratio and so on. So those early small tubes were replaced by these, you know, gigantic dishes. And of course, then in recent times, scientists have learned how to connect observatories around the globe so that we can create essentially a telescope the size of the planet. That's the Event Horizon Telescope that gave us early views of black holes. Well, in medical imaging and MRI in particular, there's been kind of a similar trajectory. We started out with very low field magnets and we've pushed um, up to higher and higher magnetic field strength to get more signal to noise ratio and contrast and, and things like that. But then very interestingly, in the very same field, in the last 10 years or so, there's been a race back down to the bottom. We, we turned around and started running down towards, towards lower field strength in order to gain accessibility, in order to uh, explore imaging in niches that we hadn't seen before. And of course, this is not entirely new either. We're following in the footsteps of other imaging modalities that have undergone this kind of miniaturization. Ultrasound, for example, began its life in big water-filled tubes. I'm showing you here the turret of a B-29 bomber, which was repurposed to put a person in and create ultrasound images. That big vat has now been replaced with a handheld wand that you can connect to a smartphone. And then of course, there are the familiar, uh, the, probably the most familiar type of imaging device, the camera, which started out as these big boxes. And now we all carry maybe three of them at least in our little cell phones. Now, I would argue that there's another type of less is more trend that many fields of imaging experienced in the last you know, few decades. And this was in some ways an attempt to make more with less data for the purposes in this case of imaging speed because data costs you time, gathering data costs you time and particularly in, in, in say a modality like MRI. So this was the origin, for example, of parallel MRI, which is where I got my start in imaging back in around 1996, we figured out that you could undersample your data, go below the Nyquist limit, as long as you had multiple different detectors and you could stitch the missing information together. Well, about 10 years after that, we discovered that you didn't even need multiple coils to go below the Nyquist limit. You could use something called compressed sensing to effectively pre-compress your images and get the same effect. And then like clockwork, another 10 years after that, interestingly enough, along came artificial intelligence in some of its uh, more powerful modern incarnations. Um, and we discovered that we could do the very same thing with AI as well. And this was again, not just in the MRI space, not just in the medical imaging space. Um, principles of compressed sensing, for example, allowed um, 
some pretty remarkable frames per second in optical imaging. I'm showing you here a video of a hundred billion frames per second image that shows a light beam essentially bouncing off a mirror. That was in around 2014, as I recall. And then by 2018, modern AI had started to be able to essentially rescue information content in low light images. Okay, so you can make what you will of this sort of lightning tour of imaging history. Here are three themes that I pull out of this. One is the theme of emulating biology in order to augment it. A second is sort of this progression of not only technologies, but also mathematical transforms that underlie imaging that allow us to do more with less. And then of course, there is the pretty remarkable, but sometimes overlooked connection among modalities and also among different spatial and temporal scales. And here are three questions then that we can think about in thinking about the future of imaging corresponding to those themes. First of all, what new lessons can we learn from biology? How can we build imaging devices of the future that take advantage of these lessons? And what can we discover by connecting the very large with the very small? And we have organized our workshop, finally getting back to the program that I promised I'd tell you about, we've organized our workshop around those themes and those questions. So we have three sessions, roughly organized around learning from biology. We have a couple of sessions on scanners of the future, juxtaposing bigger is better with less is more. And then we have a couple of sessions that aim to connect the large and the small. And I'll just delve into that a little bit in the, in, in the remaining uh, you know, 10 minutes or so, just to give you a little bit more background for, for the, the sessions to come. So in session number two, right after this one, you're gonna hear from a neuroscientist about the neuroscience of vision. And you're gonna hear from our chair of neurology about what happens when we can't see. So essentially exploring the, the function of vision through some interesting forms of dysfunction. Now, Dr. Rucci um, uh, is uh, going to tell you uh, about how our eyes are actually always moving, constantly jittering around. Um, and this presents, you could argue, a real challenge for imaging. Um, I don't want to steal too much of his thunder, but um, I'm, I'm pretty confident he's going to tell you that actually, rather than being a challenge, it's something that is being done deliberately to enhance acuity. And for that matter, if you think about it, every moment of our lives is a festival of continuous sensation. So if that's the case, why do our imaging machines have to be so rigid, right? We're very careful to set up these big tubes and these acquisition strategies, um, and we follow a, a fixed order. Well, you're gonna hear from Dr. Feng in the uh, uh, subsequent session that maybe, we don't need to be so rigid in the way we gather our data. Maybe we can gather it more continuously. And in fact, that session, session three on emulating the senses is gonna bring you now from continuous imaging to continuous sensing with wearables. And then gonna talk a little bit about how we might understand, make sense of this continuous stream of data. So that's one theme, emulating the senses. But there's more, I, I would argue, that we can learn from biology, right? I mean, you could argue that the history of imaging that I just summarized all too quickly for you, is a history of technologies and transforms inspired by and, and or, or at least pioneered by nature. So we have telescopes inspired by the bending of light in our eyes. We have x-rays, which are basically fancy shadow pictures, just with sort of a form of light on steroids. And you could argue that depth perception, for example, is a really interesting precedent for tomography taking complementary views and creating um, basically a, a resolved scene out of them. And of course, people like Jan LeCun have made it very clear that the origin, you know, the inspiration for things like convolutional neural nets is actually the, the biological organization of the mammalian and other visual systems. So there's a lot we can learn there. Let me just take depth perception for one quick moment, and I, and I believe Dr. Rucci might uh, mention a thing or two about this too, right? So the classic thing that we you know, all learn in school is, well, we have two eyes, right? And so we get two different views, and so we can triangulate depth from those two different views, right? No, bald-faced lie, if you think about it as a tomographer, because basically what we're saying is we've got two two-dimensional projections 
From two projections, we're supposed to reconstruct an entire three-dimensional scene. That's what, an acceleration factor of 100, 200? How is that possible? Well, oh, and by the way, um, try a little experiment, everybody. Close one eye now. Can you still have a sense of how far away I am from you? You probably, your sense of depth probably didn't change much, did it? So one projection to resolve all of depth? I don't think so. So what's going on? You'll hear some more, but my hypothesis is that our brains have to be relying on some form of prior knowledge, relative sizes of things, properties of lighting, all those sorts of things. So in other words, depth perception, I would argue, is another form of reconstruction from undersampled data. And of course, that's what we've just started to do in imaging. That's what I was telling you about before. And so our next session on emulating the brain, you're going to start, uh, we're going to start off with Dr. Mani, who's going to tell you about how we have in fact been learning to reconstruct undersampled data using machine learning. Now, of course, the types of information, the types of learned information that we bring in in our current algorithms are far more limited and low level than what our brains can bring in. And also our accelerations are far more limited. So maybe we have some things to learn yet from biology. But then we're also in that session going to explore different functions of the brain that we can also perhaps emulate. So for example, automatic segmentation or even learning automatically how to calculate risk directly from an image. Okay, well then we're gonna move on to scanners of the future and we're gonna explore this bigger is better trend, um, both in the imaging devices like the, the magnetic field strength in the gradient strength we use in our MR scanners, um, and also how to deal in interesting new ways with large collections of data. And we're gonna have these limit pushers that you see here to guide us uh, in this path. But then, as I said, we wanna juxtapose bigger is better with less is more. Um, and so we're gonna then have a session with other types of limit pushers who are trying to push us in MRI down to the very lowest field strengths. We're gonna start with low field MRI. We're then gonna explore whether we can actually get rid of the magnet altogether and just use the radio frequency detectors to still get images. And then you're gonna hear a little bit about imaging without images, a provocatively chosen title, which really means using AI to detect signatures automatically. And what do I mean by detecting signatures? Well, let me give you a nice concrete biological example of a signature detector, which is also a really great example of imaging miniaturization. Consider, if you will, the bat. Okay, well, bats learned long ago how to solve the depth perception problem with this ingenious development of echolocation, right? You bounce your echo off and the time it takes to come back tells you how far away something is. And this has been the model actually for our ultrasound devices, but also nowadays for the LIDAR on our cars and, and um, any other uh, uh, things, sort of uh, 3D uh, cameras like this. But let's talk for a second about how bats actually image. They can do remarkable things, right? They can dive at speed through underbrush and somehow get that small moth without dashing their brains out on a tree or a rock or something. But current evidence suggests that bats actually don't form a little radar screen in their heads, you know, with a nicely resolved image uh, you know, where the moths show up as blips. There's a sense instead but they create these sort of complex and dynamic environments of acoustic signals from which they pick out distinctive signatures and dive for them. And more than that, there's evidence that they actually change the data they're gathering to get better signatures. So for example, as they're approaching prey, they change, they, they change the frequency as well as the width of their calls. There's even fascinating evidence I just recently saw um, that bats, some bats anyway, move their ears back and forth fast enough to create Doppler signals. So they can actually get extra depth uh, uh, information about their prey. Okay, so what can we learn from bats? Can we actually maybe think about emulating bat physiology using tailored signals 
to hunt for concerning features or changes as our prey, right? That's what we want. We want our prey to be that small tumor, that small um, a worrisome change in an important organ. Okay, well, brains and bats for that matter um, exist in sort of this intermediate scale between cells and galaxies. And by the way, you've seen these images a bunch before in the talk. Uh, the image on your left is an image of a sing an optical image of a single cell. On the right, uh, it's a, a James Webb telescope uh, image of uh, dynamics, I think, in the in the Cartwheel galaxy. So, I actually met the speaker, the first speaker for our first scale connecting session in a workshop explicitly called From Cells to Galaxies that was aiming to connect radio astronomy with medical imaging. And so our scale connecting session is gonna start with um, Dr. Rao's introduction to radio astronomy for medical imagers. And I think she'll show you that actually the way we probe outer space with radio astronomy is remarkably similar in some of the interesting details um, to how we actually probe inner space with MRI, even though the machines are drastically different and what we're imaging is drastically different. We're then gonna sort of move down the scale into computational optics and then into microscopy, or actually, as Dr. Shoham calls it, mesoscopy, which brings me to our final scale connecting session, meso is the new macro. And in recent years, there's been a real revolution in the understanding of how we can probe that meso scale, intermediate between say the scale of molecules and the scale of brains or galaxies or whatever else. And you're gonna hear about several complementary ways to do it with MRI, with ultrasound, with NMR uh, uh, using quantum diamond sensors. And, and I invite you to try to explore the connections among them. Okay, well, I already mentioned that uh, there's value in, in looking back at our imaging history. So uh, as a result, we thought we'd throw in at least a couple of historical intermezzi, if you will. Um, first, as you heard from, from Dr. Latanzi, um, a, yeah, an exploration uh, of, of MRI at 50, uh, 50 years since uh, that uh, first seminal uh, 1973 paper or papers uh, that established it. And then we'll just give you a little uh, slideshow about 20 years of radiology research here at NYU Langone. But then also, of course, our main purpose together is to discuss the future of imaging. And there will be ample opportunities to do that at our poster sessions, at our uh, eye to eye dinner, at this uh, uh, nice event space uh, over on the East River, um, not far from here. Um, and then we'll, we'll try to cover some of the themes as we wrap up too. So with that, I wanna thank uh, the NIH and in particular the NIBIB who funds our center and, and gives us our mandate for this recurring workshop. Um, and I want to thank you once again uh, for coming and joining us. Uh, I, I hope you find the talks to come stimulating and um, um, perhaps just a little bit perspective altering. Uh, and I, I certainly know I will. So very much looking forward. Thank you again. And I guess we'll proceed to our next session.